introductions. Welcome to this event on Thoughtful Dialogue in Turbulent Times, Preserving Community Through the Liberal Arts with our two eminent speakers, Professors Robert George and Cornell West. I'm on the porch in beautiful downtown Lewisburg near the Bucknell University campus, which this week has gone all remote in classes, although students are still present in the strange season of COVID. Because of our guests, this webinar should be a welcome ray of intellectual sunshine on a rainy day here. We welcome Professors George and Wes back to Bucknell where they last spoke at a 2018 Martin Luther King event live and in person on the topic of what's the value of a liberal arts education. Their public testimony to the crucial importance of thoughtful dialogue across difference can be found in their joint statement on truth-seeking democracy and freedom of thought and discussion, and in their co-authored Boston Globe essay this year on the need for honesty and courage in American public discourse. For links to those documents, please feel free to email dialogue2021 at gmail.com, which will also keep you up to date on other programming. Uh, today's webinar is sponsored by the Bucknell Program for American Leadership and Citizenship, devoted to thoughtful and informed dialogue in the liberal arts tradition and co-sponsored by the Open Discourses Foundation and the Commonwealth Foundation. Uh, again, for more information on future programming, please be in touch at dialogue2021 at gmail.com. I'll briefly introduce our two speakers and after their conversation, we'll open up the event for questions and answers uh, from you with them which can be submitted in writing through the Q&A button on your webinar page. We'll try to get to as many questions as we can before the webinars end at 11.30 this morning. Professor jo Robert George of Princeton has been described as America's foremost social conservative intellectual. He is McCormick Professor of Jurisprudence at Princeton and has served as chairman of the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom and on the President's Council on Bioethics as well as a presidential appointee to the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. His scholarship articulates new natural law theory as an important force for renewing our civic sphere, as well as making the case for continued relevance of Catholic tradition. He is founder and director of the James Madison Program for American Ideals and Institutions. Professor Cornell West of Harvard has been described as America's foremost democratic socialist intellectual, his storied career of scholarship and activism on race and human rights includes the classic books, Race Matters, and his memoir, Brother West, Living and Loving Out Loud. He is professor of the practice of, political, of public philosophy at Harvard and professor emeritus at Princeton. His writings have also explored 19th and 20th century African-American leaders and their visionary legacies, including radical aspects of Reverend Martin Luther King Jr.'s thought. A frequent, a frequent guest on national media programs, Dr. West made his film debut in the classic movie, The Matrix. They have often co-taught taught classes together, examining great books and thinkers while engaging each other from two very different political perspectives. As our speakers are conversing, please share written questions for them on the Q&A button on your webinar screen, and we'll try to get to as many as we can later in the program. Mm -hmm. Professors George and West, Welcome back virtually to Bucknell. We look forward very much to your wisdom in this week before a very contentious national election and in a very challenging year of COVID. Thank you very much for returning to speak with the Bucknell community today. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Father Professor uh, Sewers. Uh, it's really an honor to be back at Bucknell, if only virtually. Uh, Brother Cornell and I had a wonderful experience visiting the campus in 2018. And that experience uh, reminded me, uh, myself, uh, a graduate of Swarthmore College, of just how valuable and important small liberal arts colleges and universities are in our overall educational system. Uh, I like to think that there should be a Princeton and a Harvard uh, at an Ohio State and a uh, University of Southern uh, California and so forth. Uh, but there should also be Bucknells and uh, Swarthmore's and Williams and Oberlin and so forth. 
uh, these institutions dedicated as they are to liberal arts uh, learning and especially to undergraduate learning are a real treasure of the American higher education uh, system. Uh, I feel I benefited enormously from uh, the attention of my professors and the dedication of the institution uh, to the liberal arts when I was an undergraduate at, uh, at Swarthmore, coming as I uh, did from the hills of West Virginia without uh, great preparation uh, for uh, encountering uh, what you have to encounter and should encounter uh, in college. Uh, being in a situation like the one that was provided to me by a distinguished small liberal arts college, one quite similar to Bucknell, was an enormous blessing. So it's great to be back at Bucknell. Uh, I want to thank uh, BPOC and the other uh, sponsors of this event. And it's always such a joy and an honor and a privilege and a pleasure to be with my great friend, Brother Cornell West. Uh, Brother Cornell is our nation's leading public intellectual. You don't need any more descriptions, democratic, socialist, conservative, liberal, right, left. Uh, Brother Cornell West is our leader. Uh, it has been uh, his witness that has been a model for uh, those of us who have tried to bring our thinking and our scholarship to bear on issues of public life, whether we are on the left or the right or somewhere in between or somewhere not on that uh, particular uh, spectrum. And Cornell has been in that role for a long time and carried it with distinction, exemplifying the virtues, uh, courage, integrity, honesty, uh, a willingness to think independently outside of categories, lay aside tribal affiliations and partisanship. Uh, that's been the witness of Cornell West, which always makes it such a pleasure to be with Cornell. We've now worked together for more than a decade and a half, teaching together, writing together, thinking together, singing together <laughs> and talk about a blessing. That really has been a blessing. I, I just learned so much uh, from Cornell, not, not only uh, his teaching by precept, but also, of course, by the wonderful example that he sets for all of us, including uh, young people, uh, especially uh, students who are uh, themselves opting for liberal arts uh, learning. Now, um, ordinarily in our dialogues, uh, I go first. There's a simple reason for that. Uh, uh, Cornell West is an impossible act to follow. <laughs> so the safe thing for me to do is to speak my little piece and get out of the way. Uh, ordinarily, I offer a little reflection of, uh, of my own. Uh, but this time, what I'd like to do uh, with a little bit of time I have here at the beginning before uh, turning things over to Professor West is read to you from a recent statement that Cornell and I put out together. It's our most recent uh, uh, co-authored piece of written work. And it's called Honesty and Courage. It's about the virtues that Cornell and I think are absolutely indispensable at the moment. It's true that all of the virtues are needed all of the time. There, there is no time and there's no place where you don't need all of the virtues to have a flourishing life or a flourishing society. That's the way it works. The virtues are a package deal. You need them all and you need them all the time. But at different times and in different places in different circumstances, some are more urgently needed, perhaps because they are ones that are lacking and perhaps their lack is at the center or their deficiency is at the center of uh, the problems that a particular people are facing at a particular time. So Cornell and I reflecting on our current situation of extreme polarization, partisanship, animosity among fellow citizens, unwillingness to treat fellow citizens as fellow citizens, the breakdown of civic friendship, the breakdown of civic virtue. Uh, we uh, put our heads together thinking about some contemporary challenges and, and issues and things that are happening in the culture. And we wrote this piece on honesty and courage. And let me just uh, share it with you. And then Cornell will have what I know will be wonderful things to say about this and other issues. So Cornell and I begin just by flatly asserting what we believe to be true. And that is that honesty and courage, these great virtues of honesty and courage alone can save our wounded, disunited country now. We have to acknowledge we are badly disunited and badly wounded, self-inflicted wounds. And we need what we lack so much in our culture today. If we are to be healed, we're to overcome our problems, honesty and courage, 
Now these virtues are never in abundant supply, but they seem especially to be lacking today. And so we need to face that. All of us need to face that. Beginning with Cornell and myself, we need to face that. We need to exemplify honesty and courage. And we do need to encourage others to exemplify those virtues. And we go on to say we need honesty and courage to speak the truth, including painful truths that unsettle not only our foes, but also our friends and ourselves. This is one of the, one of the respects in which Cornell has set such a wonderful example of a true public intellectual. We're used to prophets in the public square saying things that uh, are meant to unsettle people who disagree with them. But Cornell is willing, and we all need to be willing, we need to follow the example, to be willing even to say things, acknowledge painful truths that unsettle ourselves, that we wish would be otherwise, that, that tend to puncture the uh, ideology of uh, associations or communities or groups that we've ourselves been identified with and in whose bosom perhaps we've been nurtured. We go on to say that we need the honesty and courage to honor the contributions of the great men and women who have gone before us, those who articulated and defended true principles of justice and the common good, built or helped to preserve worthy institutions and modeled important virtues. And we not need honesty and courage to recognize the faults, the flaws, the failings of even the greatest of our heroes, and to acknowledge our own faults and flaws and failings. Cornell and I began thinking about this issue uh, when the issue arose at, arose at our own university, or at my university, what was Cornell's university and is his alma mater, Princeton University, when Princeton uh, made the decision to remove Woodrow Wilson's name from the School of Public Affairs, which had been known as the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and uh, International uh, Affairs. Um, there were certainly reasons in favor of removing Wilson's name. Wilson uh, was himself a racist. He was involved in, he, he was the leader of the move to resegregate the Washington DC uh, uh, federal bureaucracy. He has many black marks uh, against him. He also had things in his favor. He built Princeton University into a major research university, a true research uh, university. But the decision was made pretty much unilaterally by edict by uh, the leadership of uh, Princeton University without uh, consul broad consultation uh, to remove his name. And Cornell and I were concerned about that. And that's really what began the reflections that produced uh, this paper and these, and these thoughts because we do have great heroes who are responsible for giving us profoundly important and true principles of justice and human rights, like the principles of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. And yet all of those heroes were flawed. All of them were flawed. All of them have strikes against them, just as all of us are flawed and all of us have strikes against us. So we need to do two things, and the two things were the two that I mentioned. Honor our heroes, but at the same time recognize their faults. Honor them for the good things they stood for, not for the bad things that they thought or did. And that's true whether we're talking about George Washington or Abraham Lincoln or Frederick Douglass or Martin Luther King. The same principle applies. And we need the honesty and courage to recognize that. We need the honesty and courage to recognize the progress towards the ideal of equal justice and movement toward the common good that our civilization and nation have made and the blows against injustice, oppression, and tyranny we as a people have struck, sometimes at incalculable costs of blood and treasure. And we need the honesty and courage to recognize the blights on our history, the grave wrongs that have been done, reflecting the failure of our leaders and institutions and our own failures, yours and mine, to honor our principles of liberty and justice for all. So here Cornell and I are making the plea not to abandon our principles and reject them as bad, not to try to start the world anew, not to imagine that we can come up with better principles than those principles of liberty and justice articulated in our tradition but to live up to them, to recognize that when, where we have gone wrong, it has not been by an excess of fidelity to our principles. It's rather been infidelity 
whether the violation of those principles took the form of abuses against Native American Indian peoples or tribes, whether it was the sin of slavery. Uh, the many blights on our national history are not the fruit of too much faithfulness, too much fidelity to our principles, but rather the opposite, infidelity. We need to have the courage and honesty to recognize both sides of that equation. The principles are good. Our young people should recognize they have a heritage and it's a good heritage. The principles are good, but we've often failed to live up to those principles and done grave wrongs precisely by violating them. We need the honesty and courage to express dissent, to say, no, I will not go along when conscience tells us that our own ideological or political tribe has gone astray or gone too far or become fanatical and blind to the integrity and dignity of all. We need to avoid the kind of partisanship that makes us line up with our so-called side, whether it's right or left, libertarian, socialist, uh, whether it's Republican, Democrat, uh, whether it's some religion or another. We need to avoid the temptation to be a team player and to go along when our side has gone wrong and we in conscience recognize it. The pressure to conform to the group's position is very, very strong. And it takes honesty and it takes courage to avoid falling into that trap. And it's very hard then to do it because when you say, no, I will not go along with your own tribe, your own group, your own party, you will pay a price. You will be punished. You will be treated as a traitor. You will be treated as a betrayer. You may lose the fellowship of people whose uh, um, solidarity and community have been very valuable to you. So that takes real courage. That takes real honesty. We need the honesty and courage to stand up, standing alone if necessary, to speak the truth as God gives us to see the truth to the politically, economically, and culturally powerful, as well as to the relatively powerless. I'll here reveal that those last words, and also to the relatively powerless, were words that Cornell inserted uh, after I had said that it's very important that we have the honesty and courage to speak the truth to the powerful, to the economic and politically and culturally powerful. And Cornell said, you know, that's true, and you do need that honesty and courage. But let's also acknowledge that just because you're powerless doesn't mean that you are necessarily right or necessarily good or necessarily perfectly virtuous or that you don't need the truth spoken to you plainly as well. Powerful, important point that uh, Cornell introduced. We mustn't treat the less privileged as if they're mascots or as if they are themselves perfect or don't need to hear the truth, even uncomfortable truths. We need the honesty and courage to think first of the weak, the poor, the vulnerable, and the impact on them for good or ill of our public policies and our own actions. This will not generate unanimity as to what policies are best. Reasonable people of goodwill will often disagree, but it must be a starting point on which there is common ground. Cornell's a democratic socialist. I'm a traditional conservative. We're going to come to different conclusions on a lot of policy matters, important policy matters. But we begin, and we should begin, we must begin from the same premise that we've got to think first as we design policies, we think about politics, how we're going to organize our community together, whether it's at the local level, whether it's the national level, uh, how, what our stance will be in international affairs. We need to begin with thinking what will the impact on the least advantaged, the weak, the poor, the vulnerable be. And we need the honesty and courage not to compromise our beliefs or go silent on them out of a desire to be accepted or out of a fear of being ostracized, excluded, or canceled. And if you truly have the honesty and courage to stand up for what you think is right, and if you are an independent thinker who's not going to fall into line with whatever the tribe or group thinks, then there will be times when you will bear the risk of being ostracized or excluded or canceled. And without honesty and courage, you're not going to be willing to do it. We need the honesty and courage to consider with an open mind and heart points of view that challenge our beliefs, 
even our deepest, most cherished identity forming beliefs. We need the intellectual humility to recognize our own fallibility. This is a constant theme of the work that Cornell and I have done over the past decade and a half. It's all too easy to fall into the ditch of supposing that, well, on the important issues that really matter, not only am I right, I couldn't possibly be wrong. The assumption of infallibility. Now, of course, if you ask someone, well, are you infallible? They're going to recognize, no, I'm not infallible. No one's infallible. All human beings are fallible. All human beings make mistakes. But it gets really to the point of matters when the question is one of great importance on which one has deep, powerful commitments, including emotional commitments. I've often said we human beings tend to wrap our emotions more or less tightly around our convictions. And if we wrap them too tightly, we become dogmatic, we become dogmatists, and effectively assume a stance of infallibility, where we suppose not only are we right, but on the important things, we can't possibly be wrong. No need in hearing a challenge, no need in willing to be challenged. Our job is simply to teach or defeat the people on the other side, not to listen to them with the possibility of understanding that we are mistaken or mistaken in some respect or another about an important issue. We need the honesty and courage to acknowledge that there are reasonable people of goodwill who do not share even some of our deepest, most cherished, uh, cherished beliefs. This is true for Christians like Cornell and myself, or members of other traditions of faith, as well as for religious skeptics or unbelievers. It's true for conservatives, as well as progressives, for libertarians, as well as socialists. This is really a matter of empirical fact. And that is no matter what position you hold on the spectrum from right to left or somewhere off that spectrum, no matter what it is, as a matter of empirical fact, there are reasonable people of goodwill who disagree with you. Now, are you gonna treat them as enemies? Are you going to refuse to listen to their arguments? Are you going to shut them down? Are you going to cancel them? Or are you going to engage them and listen to them, genuinely listen? You're going to have the intellectual humility and the courage and honesty to genuinely listen and hear a different point of view and consider that maybe there's something to be said on their side of the argument. And we need the honesty and courage to treat decent and honest people with whom we disagree, even on the most consequential questions as partners in truth-seeking and fellow citizens of our democratic republic, not as enemies to be destroyed. And we must always respect and protect their human rights and civil liberties. Rights and liberties are a theme for Cornell and myself, a central theme. Now, they're not the only story, right? Truth-seeking is the most fundamental thing we preach, truth-seeking. But we need to recognize the rights and liberties of people in the truth-seeking enterprise, just as we need to acknowledge the truth about the rights and liberties of people to think for themselves, to speak what they think, to challenge, to be challenged. We need the honesty and courage to be willing to change our beliefs. If, if evidence, reason, and compelling argument persuade us that they are indeed in need of revision, even at the cost of alienating us from communities in which we are comfortable, you know, on the left or right, and rely for personal affirmation, solidarity, and support. We're social creatures, we're human, we human beings. We, we uh, can't flourish except in relationships with others. And that's good, that's wonderful. Our relationality, our, the relational nature of the, of, of, of the human being is a beautiful thing about the human being. We form bonds, powerful bonds of friendship and solidarity. We should do it more, actually. <laughs> but, but we come to value those bonds as we should, which then makes us very nervous and reluctant to risk those bonds where speaking the truth as we see the truth, dissenting from the group's view could cost us the affirmation and solidarity and support of the people on whom we've relied for affirmation and solidarity and support. And that's tough. We need the honesty and courage to love. Here's the bottom line, to love. To love in the highest and best sense, 
to will the good of the other for the sake of the other, to treat even our adversaries as precious members of the human family. And we need the honesty and courage to resist the hatred that zeal even for good causes can induce in us frail, fallen, and fallible human beings. The spirit of hatred corrupts the human soul and leads inexorably to spiritual emptiness and to tyranny, even among those who began as sincere advocates of freedom and justice. In other words, our stance, even as we advocate for what we believe is right, for justice and human rights as we see them, recognizing that there are other people, reasonable people of goodwill who see them differently, even as we advocate for what we believe are the best of causes, we must not embrace the concept of by any means necessary. We must not let our good cause, as we see it, be corrupted by zeal that leads to hatred of people who disagree with us. Martin Luther King here was such a wonderful example of this. Opposing injustice as he saw it, fighting it, giving witness to it, sacrificing for it, even at the cost of his own life, his martyrdom, but never hating, rejecting what was proposed to him and others, the any means necessary philosophy. Very good causes can be corrupted by hatred and the kind of zeal that leads people to lay aside anything any consideration other than the cause itself. As a conservative, I think back to the noble cause of anti-communism. It's as noble a cause as you can identify. If you look at the death toll, the body count of communism going back to 1917, looking at the Bolshevik revolution and the Stalinist period that followed it, looking at Mao's revolution in China, looking at Pol Pot in Cambodia and other communist dictators, the domination of Eastern Europe, the, the toll of communism was horrible. Communism was horrible. Fighting communism was a noble cause. Anti-communism was a noble cause. But look at how that great noble cause could be corrupted and was corrupted by figures like Joseph McCarthy, who gave a good cause a bad name. When we hear the word anti-communism today, for many of us, the names that come to mind immediately are not names like Vaclav Havel that one would hope would come to mind, or John Paul II, or Lech Valenza. No, the names that so often come to mind are Joseph McCarthy and Roy Cohn, people who corrupted the good cause. So no matter how good you think your cause is, and maybe you're right, maybe it's a very noble cause, don't allow hatred or passion to corrupt the cause or lead to bad things being done in the name of the cause. We believe that uh, finally honesty and courage could finally give this nation under God, as Lincoln said at Gettysburg, the blessing for which Harriet Tubman struggled and sacrificed and Abraham Lincoln prayed and acted. And that is a new birth of freedom. What Lincoln in the Gettysburg Address called that new birth of freedom that new birth of freedom is not something that we just needed in 1863 or 1865. It wasn't accomplished even in 18, the late 1860, uh, 1860s when we ratified the Civil War Amendments, the 13th abolishing slavery, the 14th especially um, uh, uh, conferring fundamental uh, rights on uh, the recently freed uh, slaves and their descendants. The concept of a new birth of freedom is a perennial one, I think, in any republic. It will always be necessary from time to time for the Republic to experience a new birth of freedom. But that's only possible if the people, the people who are the Republic at the end of the day, if the people repairing to their first principles of justice and human dignity, if the people are willing to be courageous and to be honest. Well, that's the end of my sermon. Let me turn it over to Brother West. My brother, those words resonate deeply in my soul even a few months later. And I uh, appreciate uh, you going over those. You know, it is always an unadulterated joy just to spend time with my dear brother, Robbie, that uh, 
my love and my respect for you uh, cuts so much deeper than whatever political disagreements we have. And it's a blessing to be able to bear witness in such a turbulent and tempestuous moment in the history of the country for people to see a friendship, a companionship, a brotherhood, but also a familyhood. You see, our families come together in a genuine reveling in each other's humanity. And, and, and what we have is really not, not abnormal in the country. It's just pushed to the margins and it's becoming more and more viewed as if it's abnormal. There's people all around the nation who come together across political and ideological and religious lines and even racial lines and regional lines and so forth, but it's not really lifted up. So it's always a blessing to be able simply to just do what for you and I is just normal. You know, just brothers having a good time wrestling with the Socratic legacy of Athens, believing the unexamined life is not worth living and then trying to take seriously the prophetic legacy of Jerusalem where our Jewish brothers and sisters gave this magnificent sense of what it is to be human is to spread hesed, to spread that loving kindness, to spread that steadfast love to the orphan and widow and fatherless and motherless. And you and I follow through with a Palestinian Jew named Jesus, our Muslim brothers and sisters at Muhammad. But it is an understanding of what it means to be human rooted in a humility on the one hand, because all of us fall short and then a moral and spiritual tenacity, which is we are going to be in the world, but not of it. We're going to be nonconformists. We're not going to be echoes that extend a certain echo chamber, but voices, our uniqueness, our irreducibility, our sanctity, our dignity is being made in the image of God, being made in the likeness of God. And that's what we've been able to do for these 15 years. And we have a good time with a smile on our face Sometimes you playing your banjo from West Virginia, and sometimes I'm singing out of tune uh, from, from California, but it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. But we do want to acknowledge uh, our precious brothers and sisters of all colors at Bucknell. Begin with the captain of the ship, Brother John, John Braveman. We, we hope and pray that he and his family are doing well. We hope and pray in each and every one of the students, faculty and staff in the middle of this pandemic are holding on. I know right now you're at a moment where you've got a certain kind of lockdown and we, we, we are in solidarity with you. We salute brother Paul Siever for his magnificent work that he's doing both as professor as well as prophetic figure coming out of the Orthodox Russian tradition and the rich legacy of, of Bucknell. Bucknell is one of the few great uh, universities founded by my fellow Baptists going all the way back to White Deer Valley Baptist Church and First Baptist Church where the first classes were held. 1846 beginning and then 1881, you changed the name with William Bucknell. Philip Roth, one of the great American writers, graduate of Bucknell University. Allison Simmons, who is now the chairman of the philosophy department at Harvard, the number one philosophy department in the country, according to Harvard. <laughs> no, that's true. But Allison Simmons is a distinguished graduate of Bucknell. She's the first woman in the history of Harvard University going all the way back to 1366 to be promoted from the inside to a tenured professor in the philosophy department. That's Bucknell University, founded by those Baptists and recognized, lo and behold, we've got to let some non-Baptists in here. Here comes some Presbyterians and Episcopalians. Oh, we've got to let some of these folk outside the Christian family bring in some Jewish brothers and sisters, bring in Muslim brothers and sisters. We've got to, of course, be secular. Our agnostics and our atheists have exactly the same dignity and sanctity as the Christians. We must be ecumenical. We must be global, come from all around the world. Bucknell University, Lewisburg, Pensa, Vania still going strong. So that's where we, this is the place that we come to. And it's always, always a blessing to do that. We probably shouldn't leave out old Christy Matheson, the great pitcher who meant so many to much to us who were deeply in baseball. But why is this important? Because already you can see that any quest for truth, for beauty, 
for goodness goes hand in hand with our histories, our traditions, our families, our communities that spill over far beyond narrow conceptions of politics, narrow conceptions of ideology, narrow conceptions of race, narrow conceptions of gender, narrow conceptions of sexual orientation. There's a humanity that cuts deeper than all of those categories. And once we lose sight of that fundamental insight, we slide down the slippery slope of chaos, disorder, hatred, contempt, envy, resentment, domination, oppression, exploitation, subjugation, and that is much of the history of the world. The history of the world is primarily the history of domination and oppression. It's primarily the history of contempt and envy and resentment. And we've got to create these moments of interruption that become institutionalized and become practices personally, eye to eye, soul to soul, socially in our civic life, in our public life, religiously ecumenical sensibilities in our ecclesiastical and other religious institutions. And then of course, more broadly in terms of the nation and the world. And that's what it is to bear Socratic witness and to bear prophetic witness. Now I am blessed of course, to also come from a people, the West family. Every time I say the West family, I have to kind of stop a little bit because it's just such a, it's such a gift of Irene and Clifton. I'll never be half the human being they are. Shiloh Baptist Church, Reverend Willie P. Cook, Deacon Hinton, Sarah Ray, my Sunday school teacher. And what was I told at Shiloh Baptist Church? Part of the Baptist tradition of Bucknell, no matter what the faults, no matter what the foibles, the teaching was if the kingdom of God is within you, then everywhere you go, you ought to leave a little heaven behind. What kind of heaven behind are you leaving? Is it tied to the virtues Brother Robbie just put forward? Integrity, honesty, decency, generosity, courage, vision beyond the present that authorizes a better reality than the one in which we find ourselves shattering our egoism, shattering our tribalism, shattering our groupism, shattering our groupthink, shattering our narrow bonds of conformity and forms of bondage that are often tied to conformity. Are we true to the legacies of the Anton Chekhovs, the greatest literary artist in the late modern world after Shakespeare? Yes, he's a product of the rich Orthodox Russian tradition, but he becomes agnostic, but he doesn't exist without that tradition. Absolute condemnation of no one, forgiveness of everyone, a patience for the fallings of every person, and yet a love, a compassion, an unbelievable empathy, genuine empathy flowing from his pen of the 8,000 characters you see in his short stories and in his plays. And he's doing that on the side because he's a medical doctor serving the poor during the day. Yes, that's what it means to come out of the Socratic and the prophetic legacies that we're talking about. Oh, if we had the capacity to listen of uh, Anton Chekhov. Oh, if we had the capacity to listen of the blues women and the jazz people that come out of the chocolate side of town, the black tradition. And this black tradition says what? In the face of hatred. Oh, it's hard to find a people who've been so hated for 400 years in the modern world in the western hemisphere but in the face of so much hatred the best of black people has always been let us try to love let us exemplify love here come john coltrane's love supreme here comes stevie wonder's love in the need of love here come martin luther king jr's love ethic here comes james baldwin's love soap ethics essays that says love forces us to take off the mask we know we cannot live within, but fear we cannot live without. Here comes Toni Morrison Catholic, like my dear brother Robbie. 
beloved. We could go on and on, the love warriors, the spiritual soldiers, the freedom fighters that in the face of hatred, love in the face of terror, not forming a black version of the Ku Klux Klan to respond to the Klan, but saying, no, we take a higher moral ground, a higher spiritual ground. We're not gonna get in the gutter with those who hate, with those who terrorize. We want freedom for everybody. That's Frederick Douglass. That's Harriet Tubman. Brother Robbie used her Bible in the Supreme Court when he was brought in as the head of the commission with Brother John Roberts. He wanted Harriet Tubman's Bible. Why? Because that's the kind of love warrior he's in solidarity with. He's not some kind of ally who wants to just hang around black people and feel as if he's doing the right thing. He wants to be a decent human being and his connection and integrity means he's in solidarity with the love of a Harriet Tubman. So even though he recognizes she's beautifully black and he's beautifully white, their humanity comes together at a level where that love transforms both of them in the sense of they become friends, partners, human beings working together beyond the superficial language of being an ally. No, it's too thin. It's too shallow. We want to know what kind of deep care and concern you have. That's why Ryan Honeba used to say any justice that's only justice soon degenerates into something less than justice. Justice is rescued by something deeper than justice. It's the love, it's the care, it's the concern, it's the willingness to be humble, to be vulnerable, to be vincible, and then be embraced. That's where the joy comes. And when we think, of where we are as a nation, suffering such spiritual decay and moral decrepitude, the eclipse so often of integrity, honesty, decency, and it cuts across politics, cuts across race, gangsters and thugs come in all colors, they come in all cultures, they come in all countries. And we should even note, Brother Robbie, those precious words that you read, not because they were written by us, we just allow those traditions, that Socratic legacy and prophetic legacy to come through us. The New York Times, no, it's not appropriate. Washington Post, not a mumbling word, no. Wall Street Journal, no, we don't want this. Thank God for the Boston Globe. What for the Boston Globe, our words would have stayed on the internet. And nothing wrong with the internet, you know, but it, wouldn't have had the same kind of visibility in terms of the more traditional newspaper form. Isn't it something that in a moment of such spiritual decay and moral decrepitude that these words have such difficulty even seeing the light of day? That in and of itself is a symptom of the problem. So it's so easy to say, well, it's really all about Brother Donald Trump. Yes, but Brother Donald Trump certainly strikes many of us as being a gangster. And I call him a gangster. I'm saying that I've got a lot of gangster in me. So when I look inside of me and see my gangster, I'm thinking I can say something, get away with it, do anything and get away with it, act as if other people aren't full of the same sanctity that I am, undercut the golden rule. Yes, and I was a gangster before I met Jesus, and now I'm a redeemed sinner with gangster proclivities. That's part of my Baptist heritage. That's part of my Christian tradition. But Trump is a symbol and a symptom of the deeper spiritual decay that cuts across the nation. Part of the sign and symptom of the moral decrepitude that cuts across the nation. And therefore we have to examine ourselves. No easy, cheap name calling and finger pointing, but rather a serious and substantive self-examination, self-inventory, self-interrogation, self-scrutiny that then connects to a critique of our communities, our societies and our world. But in the end, and that's why when Brother Robbie ended on that love, you see that, that love of, of neighbor, that love of truth, the condition of truth, one condition is to allow suffering to speak, the love of beauty, 
the crucial role of the arts. No accident that Brother Robbie is one of the finest banjo players of his generation, as well as one of the finest minds in political philosophy. Why? Because beauty in the face of the tear and the trauma allows us to remain tied to our humanity in a humane way, in a, with a sense of humor with our humanity, teasing out something deeper than pleasure, rather the joy. Because our young brothers and sisters, I'm sure you could testify so much of American culture with its weapons of mass distraction is a joyless quest for insatiable pleasure, for more titillation, more stimulation, more spectacle, more image, more fame, more celebrity, but it's empty without joy. It's empty without love. It's empty without friendship. It's empty without learning how to open yourself and give of yourself. What kenosis is all about, the self-emptying that we that, that, that we see so much in the best of our human beings. And as Christians, of course, we, 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 we highlight that on the cross. The emptying of oneself with a love that has the capacity to change and transform each and every one of us because by being made in the image and likeness of God, each one of us have the capacity to be better have the capacity to change, have the capacity to go another way, have the capacity to be transformed. And that's why we don't give up on each other. It's not a question of just being woke. It's a matter of being fortitude, having fortitude, staying fortified and acknowledging people wake up at different times. Just like we woke up at a particular time and no one was born woke. And what does woke mean? Shattering the sleepwalking of callousness of indifference. And the great rabbi Abraham Joshua Hesh used to say, indifference to evil is more insidious than evil itself. William James right here at Harvard where I am, the most adorable of all public philosophers, used to say e indifference is the one trait that makes the very angels weep. So this is more than tolerance that we're talking about. This is more than civility. Yes, we need more civility. Yes, we need more tolerance. John Bolin, my dear brother, colleague and former student, has written one of the great books on tolerance, tolerance among the virtues. Take a peek at that book. But he recognizes, as Robbie said, that all of the various virtues are interwoven. The unity of the virtue that Aristotle and Aquinas talked about with such insight. So that in the end, it, this is not just talking about tolerance and civility is talking about humility that's spiritual with moral consequences it, it's talking about a capacity of receptivity to learn how to listen just like count Basie had to always listen to what the various other folk were doing in his band to respond that's what jazz is all about finding your voice, not echo. And you can't find your voice without listening to other voices. And you learn something from the people you disagree with as much as agree. You may disagree with their conclusion and still see insights into how they think. Just like we fundamentally disagree with the conclusions of Plato. But oh, we are forever enriched by how he gets there. Forever enriched by the dialogue forever enriched by the give and the take of the voices in those magnificent dialogues, even given our critique of the slavery of his day, the patriarchy of his day, the friend versus foe, the Greek versus barbarian distinctions that he accepted. So in that sense, you out Socrates, Socrates, you out Platonize Plato, but you also know they have something to give. And this is true for any of the great thinkers, be they from Asia, Middle East, be they from Africa, be they indigenous thinkers and so forth. This is what Brother Ravi and I try to highlight and in our own feeble way, try to exemplify in a moment that is so grim and so 
bleak in many ways. And yet in the middle of the bleakness and the grimness, right when it's most dark, you can see the stars. You can see the stars. I was blessed to write a song this summer with my great funk master, Bootsy Collins, called Star. Stars have no name, they shine. Stars have no name, they shine. Fannie Lou Hamer used to sing, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Leaving that heaven, that Socratic heaven of questioning, beginning with oneself. The prophetic heaven of love and justice, not hatred and revenge. And then Sly Stone used to say, everybody is a star. So don't look to the stage, the TV, a film to find your star. There's something deep inside of you that your mother and father and grandparents and tradition put there that says, I want you to be a human being holding on to virtues in such a way that when people interact with you, they can see the light inside of you shining, connecting with them, intellectually spotlighting those who are suffering, the poor and the widow and the fatherless and the motherless and the least of these, and artistically trying to heal, to be a wounded healer, not a wounded hurter. With that healing, with that love, with that justice, we've got some possibility of dealing with the catastrophes coming at us, the ecological ones, the possible nuclear ones, the economic ones, the political ones, the social ones, the psychic ones, the moral ones, the spiritual ones, all very, very serious. We live in the age of catastrophe. What are we going to do in the face of catastrophe? Well, like blues people, you look at that catastrophe and say, what? I'm not surprised by evil. I'm not paralyzed by despair. That evil and despair will never have the last word in my life. That I will unflinchingly confront it, but I'll hold on to the love, the hope, some form of faith, even if in the secular form, hold on and then keep that smile on your face and that style that you have and that fortitude in your soul. Beautiful. Let, let, me, uh, let me just uh, revisit three of uh, Cornell's themes, uh, just to offer a little explanation uh, of a couple of them and then a thought about the third. Uh, Cornell mentioned that uh, the piece that we did on honesty and courage uh, was initially submitted uh, to the New York Times. Uh, the New York Times got back to us, uh, not only rejecting the piece, the piece but uh, uh, the woman who wrote back to us said, he didn't understand what we were trying to say. Now, uh, you, you heard me read it to you. Cornell and I can be accused of many things and I'm sure we have many faults, but a lack of clarity in saying what we mean <laughs> That's usually not something that we get criticized for. And, and, and you, you heard what I said in each case, uh, uh, quoting from the piece that Cornell and I did about honesty and courage, uh, that someone could think that, uh, if someone think, could think we're wrong, that's fine, fine, think we're wrong. I mean, if you've got a problem, fine, you're right. But, to say that I don't understand, that we can't publish this because we don't understand what you're trying to say. I don't see how we could have been clearer about what we were trying to say. And as Cornell said, the fact that we would get such a response, not only a rejection, but the fact that we would get such a response, I don't know what you're saying, really puts a yellow highlighter right on the problem. People can't see it. We're, we, we, we've gotten ourselves into such a dangerous state of affairs that people can't see what you're trying to say when you diagnose the problem, when you put your finger on the virtues that are lacking and are, that are so desperately needed, if we're to overcome the problems that everybody today ought to be able to see we, we have. So we tried the Washington Post. No, they weren't interested in it either. Uh, I said to Cornell, well, I'm sure the Wall Street Journal uh, will, will take it. I, I have a lot of experience with the Wall Street Journal. Well, we almost immediately got a rejection there as well. Now, let me just tell you, 
had Cornell written a piece attacking Donald Trump, or had I written a piece attacking the Democrats, we would have had no problem getting that published in one of the major national <laughs> newspapers. They love that. They love that. They love to have, you know, somebody with some standing or a fancy university uh, chair or something like that attacking his enemies. They'll they'll go for that if it's a conservative source the, and, and you got some prominent person attacking the, the left, they, they've got to go for that in a shot. Same way the other way around. You got a, you got a left-wing uh, uh, journal or paper and they got some prominent person uh, attacking somebody on the conservative side or attacking the Republicans or what have you. Oh yeah, we can publish that. But here you've got something that's diagnosing the underlying problem, a lesson that we strongly believe has got to be heard and taken on board by everybody across the spectrum. And not only is there no interest in publishing it by these major papers, you know, there's even the question of whether the people reading it will understand what we're trying to say. And God bless the, the, the Boston Globe. In this case, uh, Cornell uh, knew a wonderful uh, person there uh, who heads up <clears throat> the editorial page and she immediately uh, jumped for it. But I. I fear Cornell. I, I worry that the reason she did it, she's an old school type like you. Oh, and you. absolutely. Sister Margaret, Sister Margaret, that's true. That's true. It might be that's a generational true. thing where, where, you know, she's still got hold of uh, the kinds of, uh, the kinds of virtues that we're here uh, calling for. At least you can see their importance. Uh, the second thing is I just need to fill people in a little about that story that Cornell told about Harriet Tubman's Bible. Well, uh, this goes back to 2015-16 when I had the honor of being elected chairman of the U.S. Commission on International uh, Religious Freedom, which does very important. The commission is, a, is a, an independent federal agency that does very important work promoting the cause of religious freedom and trying to offer some protection, lobbying our own uh, government uh, for protection uh, in U.S. foreign policy and diplomatic matters for the worst victims of abuses of religious freedom, uh, uh, Uyghur Muslims in China or Tibetan Buddhists, uh, Christians in uh, Vietnam, Protestant and uh, Catholic, uh, Muslims in, um, in uh, Myanmar, uh, Burma, uh, people in Somalia or Sudan, uh, Ahmadi Muslims in Saudi Arabia or uh, Pakistan, Jews, of course, in so many places where there's still this terrible curse of anti-Semitism. So uh, given the important work in the human rights field that the commission is charged to do, when I was elected uh, chairman, uh, I wanted to be sworn into my office. I was going to be sworn in by Chief Justice Robert uh, on a historically important Bible. Now, all Bibles are important. Uh, the Bible is the Bible. But I wanted to be sworn in on a historically important Bible. And uh, especially I thought I'd, I'd love to be sworn in on the Bible of a great human rights hero. Now, what greater human rights hero do we have than Harriet Tubman? Now, um, I didn't know uh, where, I assumed Harriet Tubman probably owned a Bible. She was not a wealthy person, obviously, never was in her entire life. Uh, um, but I imagined that Harriet Tubman would have a Bible and I thought there probably it's probably somewhere in a museum or something like that, in some sort of collection. So I got online and found that Harriet Tubman's Bible is among uh, the uh, Harriet Tubman memorabilia at the Harriet Tubman House in Auburn, New York on the Underground Railroad, which is a wonderful uh, small uh, museum dedicated to the, to the great abolitionist, the great uh, uh, slavery hero, Harriet, uh, Harriet Tubman. And I also wanted uh, my dear brother Cornell West to hold the Bible for me when I was sworn in. And I got in touch with Cornell and he of course very kindly agreed to, uh, to do that. So I uh, phoned up the folks at the Harriet Tubman house and got on the line and said, I'm about to give you an unusual request. I said who I was. I said I was gonna be coming the chairman of the uh, US Commission on International Religious Freedom uh, and that I uh, wanted to be sworn into my office on Harriet Tubman's Bible and ask if it might be possible uh, to, to borrow uh, that treasure, that uh, wonderful treasure uh, for this uh, purpose. And there was a little hesitation on the line and I, I, I jumped in and said, uh, uh, I'm gonna be sworn in. The person who's gonna be holding the Bible for me is my dear uh, friend and teaching partner, Cornell West. 
and the very nice lady said, oh, well, yes, uh, I think we can arrange to have that, uh, have that Bible <laughs> shipped, shipped down to you. And they were wonderful. The folks at the Harriet Tubman house uh, shipped the Bible down, uh, you know, properly uh, packaged and, and so forth. Uh, and uh, Cornell and I met in Washington, D.C. I had the Bible. It's a great big Bible. It's amazing to me. It's a beautiful Bible. Uh, there are some pictures online, if anybody would care to look it up. There's actually there's some pictures of Cornell and me with the Bible online. Uh, a beautiful Bible. How a poor woman was able to afford such a Bible, she must have saved uh, in order to do that. It, and, it, and it's a testimony to her faith that, uh, that she would have uh, uh, paid so much money when she had so little uh, for such a Bible. Uh, in any event, when we were uh, there in Washington, D.C. and heading up to the Supreme Court, walking up the steps to the Marble Temple, I had the Bible. It's a great big Bible under my uh, arm. Cornell and I were walking together, and we walked past the, some of the police officers who were uh, there at the court, the regular police officers who uh, staff the court and guard the court. And I noticed that uh, Cornell caught the eye of one of the officers, and, and they exchanged a um, a very uh, solemn look, uh, look that might have been interpreted as a certain amount of suspicion between the two of them. So when we got out of here, we walked along and when we finally got out of earshot, I said to Cornell, Cornell, what, what, what was that going on there between you and that police officer? I saw he, you give each other a look. And he said, well, Brother Robbie, um, that is the officer who arrested me the last time I was down here at the court. Uh, when I was uh, doing a protest, uh, practicing some civil disobedience in front, in front of the court. And then he said, you know, Brother Robbie, now that I think about it, this is the first time I've ever been at the court when I wasn't down here to get arrested in protest. <laughs> but we went in and we were received royally. You remember, Cornell? Absolutely. So Absolutely. graciously, but Chief Justice Roberts, uh, my parents were there. And yeah, your parents. Oh, your precious parents, brother. Precious parents. And, uh, Chief Justice Roberts uh, did the honors. Cornell uh, very, very kindly and graciously held the Bible uh, for me. And then the Chief Justice gave us a tour of the inner sanctum of the, of the court, and that was a wonderful occasion. And then the third point, just a brief uh, comment. Uh, Cornell at the end put his finger, at the end of his remarks, really put his finger on something important for those of us who are involved in the project of liberal arts education, those of us on the teaching side, those of us on the learning side. And that is a true liberal arts education is, in my view, the antidote to the transvaluation of values that we have witnessed in our society over a period of many, many, many decades. And this transformation has led us down a path that human beings are always tempted to go throughout all of human history. There's nothing actually novel here, but it is always to be resisted and we seem to have fallen into it in a bad way. And that is, what do we place value on? We too often place value on and we encourage people, encourage young people to place value on wealth, status, power, influence, prestige. Now, it's important to understand these are not bad things. They're not bad in themselves. Uh, why do students come to college? Well, in part, they want to come to college to get good jobs, high paying jobs, have more wealth, uh, have the social status that comes from a prestigious degree from a place like Bucknell or Harvard or Princeton or wherever it is. Uh, they, they want to have influence and if you use your money for good things, that's great. If you use your status for good ends, give testimony to great things, wonderful. If you, uh, if you uh, use your influence to influence things for good, that's great too. These things are not bad in themselves, but they must never be confused with what is ultimately important. They are merely instrumentally good, not intrinsically good. They are not uh, inherent values, constitutive aspects of our flourishing as human beings. The trouble, the transvaluation occurs when they are made ultimate and they displace what should be ultimate, faith, family, friendship, compassion, justice, love. In a true Socratic liberal arts education, the critique of that transvaluation will be part of the very essence of your learning, whether you're reading Plato or, or 
Shakespeare, whether you're reading Chekhov or Toni Morrison, what, no matter who you are engaging, Matthew Arnold, Thomas Aquinas, you're gonna be learning the skills of thinking about ultimate things, about values, about what's important that will enable you to see through the ephemera, enable you to see the superficiality of a life led, dedicated to pleasure, money, influence, status, those secondary values, values that can all too easily, of course, lead us astray. They're not bad in themselves. They can be used for good, but can also lead us astray and must never displace what are truly ultimately important. Thank you both so much for those powerful thoughts and um, discussion of the relationship between virtues and the liberal arts and also the condition of our country today. Thank you again so much. Uh, we do have some good uh, questions coming in and I wonder, I, I hate to interrupt the conversation here, but maybe oh, absolutely. we could um, look at some of the questions. I'll try to group them together a little bit. Uh, one. One group of questions uh, seems to focus on universities today in terms of how can universities promote the type of virtues of which you have spoken so eloquently, both of you. Uh, how can universities pr promote those kinds of virtues more? And um, how can um, students practice those virtues if they may have faculty Hopefully not, but this seems to be a problem for some students that they may have faculty who are promoting one ideology or another. They may be concerned about um, how that will affect their grades or their careers. Um, and in general, um, uh, with the larger society, how can we promote the kind of dialogue that does not um, involve canceling people for their viewpoints, whether that may come at one point or another from the right or from the left. But just to get back to the main fo focus of this um, cluster of questions, um, well, what, what steps can universities take to try to further uh, what you all have been discussing today? Cornell? Well, I mean, one is that um, you know, universities are very, very special places because they're the spaces in our culture where we want robust and uninhibited dialogue, conversation, contestation, argument, evidence adduced, valid conclusions reached. Also places where we want visions, stories, narratives in our histories, in our arts to be unleashed. So on the one hand, we've got to have a strong libertarian sensibility that says that we're gonna fight for people who we think are wrong to express themselves as long as they don't get engaged in injurious harm. I mean, John Stuart Mill's harm principle is very important. You don't want people just trying to trash people or hurt people or destroy people. There, you just have some rules, but the rules must be very thin. The rules can't in any way obstruct or impede robust, uninhibited dialogue, argument, contestation variety of analyses, visions, stories, and narratives. The other thing is we've got to have administrators, professors, students who are exemplars of the virtues. They're not By exemplar, I'm not talking about fully approximate because nobody's gonna fully approximate those. We all fall short, but we're aspiring to. We can't have folk who just completely undercut and negate the virtues themselves in terms of a robust conversation. That's what cancel is all about. See? And cancel itself, you know, is just such a, uh, it's such a fundamental undercutting of the golden rule. Would you like to be canceled? No, then why are you canceling somebody else? Because I can get away with it. Oh, so I see. You're not concerned about consistency and integrity. You're concerned about power. And if everything is reduced to power, as in Plato's Republic with Thrasymachus, and might makes right, and greed is good, and it's survival of the slickest and the most powerful, and it's 
catching the Ten Commandments, obsessing with the Eleventh Commandment, thou shalt not get caught, then you're not going to have a university. You're really not going to have a university. You're just going to have a collection of people coming together, trying to get a degree that can engage in genuine dialogue with no sense of community or public that people can enter because they don't want to be humiliated. They don't want to be trashed. And you end up with just cheat schooling rather than genuine education. And Bucknell, given its long history, is about paideia, P-A-I-D-E-I-A. That's deep education. That's not cheap schooling. You don't want to just get informed and get a skill. You want to be transformed in critical consciousness and a loving soul to be an actor. That is so powerful and so true. Absolutely. Bravo, Cornell. Uh, let me just add this. Uh, not just Bucknell, but all colleges and universities uh, whether they are secular or religious, need to be truth-seeking institutions. They have to understand that that fundamentally is the mission and that anything that interferes with that mission has got to be reformed or possibly eliminated. Now, for a long time, athletics in colleges and universities was conducted at some places in such a way, given so much emphasis uh, so much of the university's resources were dedicated to them that they began to push out or undermine the truth-seeking, the intellectual mission of the university. And when athletics goes that down that path, it's got to be reformed, or maybe in some cases, in cases of some sports, eliminated. I don't think there's anything in principle wrong with college athletics. Not at all. I think it can be a valuable part of the college experience, but it is not constitutive of what universities are supposed to be about. It's not the defining mission of the university. Athletics should be there to support the defining mission of the university and educating a whole um, uh, person. And it can be the same with other things, including justice seeking, causes, social justice, uh, uh, the, the art, all sorts of activities which are themselves not bad and which have a proper place at universities become a problem when they start to displace the mission of the university as a truth-seeking institution. And universities can only be truth-seeking institutions when they are communities of truth-seekers. So the institution needs to exemplify certain virtues and honor certain values, and so do the members of the university. That is the faculty and the students and the staff of the university. And we have to remember, by the way, on just the side point, the staff who serve us in universities, they're part of the community too. Absolutely. And they are serving the truth-seeking mission of the university if, in fact, the university is being loyal to its truth-seeking mission. And if you actually bother to talk to people on the staff up and down the ladder, you will see that they understand that and value that and value the fact that they're working for a university and want to be working for the university because they believe in the mission. And they should have the same rights and be honored in the same way as students and, and uh, uh, faculty. It's a three-legged stool, not a two-legged stool, not just students and uh, and, and That's exactly right. Now, the truth-seeking business. There are conditions of truth-seeking. If those conditions aren't in place, you're not going to be able to conduct the enterprise of truth-seeking. And then you're going to fall into the ditch. You're going to, the university is going to be distracted off into some other cause. It might be ideological, it might be athletics. It might be a disturbed, dis, uh, uh, disoriented, passion for a ranking status. You can get hung up on being, you know, in the top 10 in US News and World Report. And so you, instead of focusing on what will really advance the truth-seeking mission, the educational mission of the university, you start manipulating things at the university to get in the categories, to get the scores within the categories that'll get you moved up the, the rankings table. If academics are human beings like other people. We can fall into the same traps that other people can fall into. And even ranking systems can encourage that sort of thing. So what are some of these conditions? Well, central to them is exactly what Cornell was saying. You need the freedom to inquire. You need the diversity of viewpoints within the faculty and among the student body that enables real conversations to occur where people are not just echoing each other or reinforcing each other in what they already believe, where there's serious Socratic challenges going on 
because people don't just assume in advance that everybody believes the same thing. You need that difference. That what, what makes those Socratic dialogues, the ones that Plato gives us, so fruitful and rich is that you do have genuine disagreement there being depicted between Plato, I'm sorry, between Socrates and his interlocutors, and sometimes among the interlocutors uh, themselves. And that's critical to the truth-seeking mission. And unless you have an atmosphere of freedom, you're not gonna be able to have that diversity of opinion and people are not gonna be free to express it. And you will soon fall into groupthink, the stifling, suffocating reality of groupthink. It's toxic to the learning enterprise. It's toxic to, to, to truth seeking. It undermines the mission of the uh, university. That's why I'm opposed to speech codes and all that kind of stuff and, and uh, cancellation, which is terrible. Uh, the, pe people can radically disagree and yet contribute valuably to the truth-seeking enterprise of the university. I'd encourage anyone who's interested in this question, uh, th those who put questions like this and anyone who's interested, to have a look at a piece Cornell and I did in 2017. It's available online. It's called Truth-Seeking Democracy and Freedom of Thought and Discussion, or Freedom of Thought and Expression. Um, and it begins with uh, truth-seeking democracy. I can remember that for sure. Look that up. In there, you will see that Cornell and I make the point that there is a certain proper currency of intellectual discourse. It's a currency that consists of what Cornell was just talking about, reasons, arguments, evidence. And we need to welcome into the conversation and critically be willing to engage with anybody who's willing to do business in the proper currency of intellectual discourse, giving reasons, making arguments, presenting evidence, even if they are for positions that we abominate. This is the sort of old fashioned liberalism that Cornell and I uh, are united on. Him from his perspective on the left, my from my, me from my conservative perspective. And yet here we are uh, joined with uh, this figure of whom we've both been critical in so many other ways, John Stuart Mill. But here's where his so-called liberalism is correct. That's right. That's right. You need that openness to ideas, that willingness to engage even shocking, scandalous positions if someone is prepared to defend them with reasons and argument. I, 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 for example, have defended my colleague Peter Singer's right to advocate for the morality of infanticide. There's nothing I find more abominable than that as far as a position. I will fight against infanticide with every breath in my body. I would utterly oppose any alteration of our laws. I'm a pro-life person. I mean, I don't, I'm, I'm opposed to abortion. I'm certainly opposed to infanticide. And yet when the disability rights people come around as they do every few years and chain themselves to the gates of the university, and I understand why, I understand their position. Uh, they are protesting Professor Singer, demanding that his tenure be revoked by Princeton, demanding that he be fired. I defend his right. Not because I think in, in the abs just as a matter of abstract right falling down from the heavens, uh, anybody has the right to say whatever they think. Rather, it's because the truth seeking mission of the university requires that we engage with and take seriously and, and, and consider the arguments made by anybody, even someone advocating something we regard as abominable, who gives us reasons, makes arguments and provides evidence. We learn from that. My own views have been enriched by forcing, by being forced to engage with Peter Singer. He's a smart person, an intelligent person, uh, not a person of bad will, not a demagogue, not a monster, but who holds positions that I think are monstrous. But he argues for them with reasons. He adduces evidence. He makes me think, and I think he's enriched my understanding. I've been forced to make better arguments. I've deepened my understanding of the underlying question of what makes human beings creatures with dignity and virtue of this. So we mustn't cancel people, rule people out, stop them from speaking their minds because we disagree with what they are advocating. Now it's a different issue if it's intimidation, threats, you know, there, there are limits to what people can be allowed to say. Uh, even under our constitution, uh, the first amendment does not protect genuine obscenity, false advertising, conspiracy, intimidation, threats. As Cornell said, there have to be some rules and we should engage with each other civilly. Shouting at somebody and calling a name is not giving a reason. So we need civility, but we need to be open 
to being challenged down to the root to the this, this is the message of socrates down to the root to our most fundamental cherished identity forming beliefs Absolutely. so we have um we're we're running short on time here this is all uh such a wonderful conversation and i wish it could go on forever but all good things <laughs> come to an end here um but um we have a cluster of questions. I wonder if it's possible to maybe get a brief response from each of you that cluster around the issue of corruption, of uh, corruption in our society and, and all institutions distrust uh, as a result, but also the tendency of people in their own factions now to listen only to their own set of facts, whether it's factions on the right or on the left. And to do so without uh, reflecting or encountering our own gangsterism, as Professor West put it earlier, um, that um, where do we get the practical strength, the wherewithal to look at corruption in our own hearts and, and also try to deal with that in our society without just giving up, joining a faction, or just becoming totally isolated from public life? Uh, I know that's like a, a big set of questions here, but I wonder if briefly each of you could respond to that, and then we'll probably need to close. No, I think we just have to try to exemplify in our own lives. We've got to hang out with people that you disagree with. You got to spend some time with people that you might have an issue with suspicion. You find out, lo and behold, they've got some wonderful qualities, even though they're wrong about some other issues. We've got to somehow break out of our silos. We've got to break out of our narrowness. And then intellectually, in our teaching, you know, we got to show our teachers, we got to show our, our, our students. Why did an atheist revolutionary like Shelley fall in love with a Christian poet called Dante? What's going on in the triumph of life? How could he be so deeply invested that he knows he cannot do what he's called to do without being rooted in someone he disagrees with? We can go on and on in this regard. You see that the Dostoevsky, Christian, how many atheists has he produced? millions, but he's got an indictment of Christianity as a Christian. So that Saul Bellow would say, secular Jewish brother to the core, I can't write without Dostoevsky. Well, this is already exemplified in our teachings, in our curriculums, if we can make that kind of uh, knowledge available to our young brothers and sisters to see Kendrick Lamar, he's a Christian. Well, he's doing all that cussing. Well, he's doing all that soul wrestling. You don't say. Soul wrestling takes a lot of different forms, but he walks around with, I am a follower of Jesus Christ. Well, he's the greatest hip hop artist at the moment. Not as deep as Rakim, but that's another issue. But he, he, he's, he, he's, he's having impact around the world. So people's not, not tied to just his blackness, just his, same would be true with Toni Morrison's Catholicism. She's not just a feminist. She's not just a womanist. She goes to mass. We just recently lost her almost every day. Well, what is it about her Catholicism? Well, let's engage that. Those are the kinds of things intellectually that are tied to us, or our examples on the ground concretely. Yeah, uh, Cornell's absolutely right about the need for exemplars, people who set good examples. And he himself has, has done it. I just wish that people could see Cornell West in the classroom as I have on so many uh, occasions. One thing you would see if you were in the classroom is the opposite of indoctrination. So if one of our students is making left-wing arguments, that student is likely to be challenged more aggressively by Cornell West than a conservative student would be. Why? Because Cornell's not there to reinforce anybody's ideology, whether they agree with him or disagree with him. He's there to make them learn, make them think more deeply, more critically, and for themselves. If he notices a student falling into groupthink, falling into that way of thinking that you think when you're in the echo chamber, he's gonna to try to rescue that kid, drag that kid out of there. Look at the syllabus, look at the syllabus. Pe people these days are so concerned about, you know, do you have this, the, the people of different races, colors, and so forth on the, on, on the syllabus. What's interesting, you look at Cornell's syllabus, you have people of different points of view you know, here you, have, here you have a left scholar, Cornell West, who's teaching students 
forcing students to engage Burke, Vogelin, Leo Strauss. Hey, what's going on here? Wait a minute, Cornell was supposed to be a leftist. Why isn't his, his reading list all, you know, Marx and Marcuse and the people we would expect? It's because he's setting the example. It just comes naturally to him of what you do, what you read, how you structure a course, how you challenge students when your goal is not getting them to think like you, but to getting them to think and think more deeply and think for themselves. So I think that's really what we have to do. And, and if, if students are encountering professors, the, the previous question raised this point about, you know, what if professors are just, you know, using their classrooms to indoctrinate? Well, raise the questions, raise the questions, challenge. Uh, now that, that's gonna take a certain amount of courage if, 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 if the professor is intolerant, and I know we've got a climate of intolerance and fear on a lot of campuses these days, but that's gonna require some courage from the students. You know, you're grownups now. Stand up, raise the questions, ask the professor, why is the, the reading list one-sided, right? Why is there nobody on the conservative side if it's a, if it's a liberal or left indoctrination sort of uh, course going on? Raise those questions, make suggestions. We should be reading Eric Vogelin's work on political Gnosticism. There's a powerful critique from someone on the conservative side. Maybe it's time to go back and look at some of what Burke wrote. Is Burke even mentioned? If not, why not? So I think we need to be willing to challenge this temptation and tendency that we're seeing today for education to degenerate into indoctrination, where professors and institutions are concerning themselves too much with what conclusions students reach, where they end up on the political spectrum, and not nearly enough with thinking itself. And Alf, that's where BPOLC, uh, if, I can, if, I, if I can say, I think here's where organizations such as yours at Bucknell are so critically important, making sure that there is a range of voices. Uh, the, the Black National Anthem is Lift Every Voice. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful anthem. It's a beautiful anthem. And the sentiment is exactly right. Lift every voice, every voice. That means we're going to have different voices, not all the same. You know, we hope there'll be a certain amount of harmony, but there'll also be some cacophony. We lift every voice, right? We need all the voices in the conversation. It's true that in the past, it's been too narrow. Voices have been excluded because of race and other factors. And that's got to be corrected. It is being corrected, has been corrected in so many places. But let's not fall into the echo chamber into the group think. Let's make sure that there's a diversity of substantive opinions that students engage in our classes, whether they're in sociology or history, economics, political science, philosophy, religion, English literature, what have you. Well, thank you so much to you both. And uh, I wish we could have you here every week, but I hope that we can have you back at some point in the future, either live or in webinar form in the not distant future. And, um, really appreciate this discussion. Thanks for all the good questions, everyone. I think the speakers are able to see the questions you posted. We weren't able to get to all of them, so apologies, but we really appreciate the riches of your uh, sharing of wisdom today with us. And uh, I'll just point out that, um, again, if you would like links to the statement and article that were cited today by our two speakers, um, feel free to email either me or you can email um, dialogue2021 at uh, gmail.com also for information on our programming. And we also um, have an event coming up Thursday um, on the 70th anniversary of the Korean War. Uh, the military historian Victor Davis Hansen will be speaking and uh, that's dedicated to the memory of George Raymer, class of 1950 uh, from Bucknell who was killed in Korea. Uh, allowing some of his uh, fellow American soldiers to escape from a bad situation, won the Medal of Honor. Uh, he was just a year out of uh, Bucknell when that happened. So we'll uh, hopefully look forward to that historical discussion on Thursday at 8 p.m. But meanwhile, thanks again so much to our speakers. Really appreciate it. And uh, uh, thanks to everyone who was able to tune in as well. Thank you, Al. Thank you, Brother Paul. Thank you.
Let's take care. It <laughs> Brother Robbie, we, 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 we try to connect. <laughs> <laughs> exactly.